Well, hello to you all. Uh, it is indeed an honor to sit here with you today and to open the Word of God with you. Uh, while the setting is very different than we are used to, uh, I believe that God can still use uh, this time together as we all individually or in small groups uh, watch and, and worship together that we can still learn and grow. And as I think about what we're going to talk about today, uh, Pastor Thompson and I uh, decided to continue the series that I was doing. We started it uh, quite a while ago, long before the events of the world are what they are today. And yet, I still believe that as we open the Word of God today, that uh, some of the lessons and some of the challenges that the characters and the people we're going to talk about today faced are in many ways similar to the situation we find ourselves in today. So before I open in prayer, let me just set the stage for where we have been in our study. We've been talking through the book of Judges, and I've kind of broken down the, the series into four sets of two. Uh, four sets of two characters normally. So first we had two men who were driven by action. These are the judges Othniel and Ehud, who are men who acted decisively to achieve great victory for God. Then we had two men who were men of fear, and they were Barak and Gideon. And while their efforts did accomplish great victories, they are marked by some amount of fear or hesitancy and pursuing with full abandon what God had set out for them to do. Then we had two men of failure, Jephthah and Samson. And while they could have been great men of God and accomplished great things, both of their stories end sadly because of their sin or their pride. They suffered great loss to themselves. Now the book of Judges then, for the most part, we, we finish with the story of Samson, but there's actually, after Samson, two more stories. And it is our final set of two. And rather than follow individuals, these stories open our eyes to the whole nation of Israel and let us look in on some of the circumstances that were going on during that time and they open a very negative view of what was going on. We need to look at why these things happened, why these stories took place, what were the people failing to do that ended up causing them these great heartaches. So let me stop and pray and then we're going to look at this passage and judges together. Our Father in heaven, we, we thank you for the opportunity we have to study your word. Uh, whether we are together or separate, uh, your spirit can work. And I ask that you will use our time uh, together in your word to encourage us and to help us better understand how we can live our lives, no matter the circumstances, in a way that pleases and honors you. May you work through the preaching and the sharing of your word right now to encourage our hearts and challenge us uh, to seek you out and to live for you no matter what life may be doing around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So what we have come to now here is Judges chapters 17 through 21. And these are two longer stories that take place. And the first story is the one we're going to look at today, Judges chapter 17 and 18, and then there is another story in Judges 19 through 21. Now, while the stories are very different and involve different people, there are three different things that unite the two stories together, and I want to share those with you uh, briefly. The first thing that unites both of these stories is a phrase that the author of Judges uses, and he shares that during that time there was no king. He does it in chapter 17, verse 6. He says, in those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And that phrase is going to be repeated again in chapter 18, verse 1. There was no king in Israel. 
He's going to repeat it in chapter 19, verse 1. There was no king in Israel. And then at the very end of the book, in chapter 21, in verse 25, the very last verse of the book, it says there was no king in Israel. So this phrase and this idea that there was no king and everybody did that was right is a theme. And we're going to come back to this theme. I just wanted you to see those connected verses. Now also, both of these stories have something to do with the town of Bethlehem. In chapter 17, verse 7, it starts with a young man out of Bethlehem who is initiating and beginning this story. And then the same thing happens again in chapter 19. Uh, this man gets a concubine out of Bethlehem. And these two individuals are the beginning points of these two stories. So there's no king, and both stories originate with someone from Bethlehem. Now the third thing that connects both stories is that both of them start with a Levite who is wandering the land looking for a, a job or a place to live. In chapter 17 of Judges, verse 8, it, it says that this, this Levite from verse 7 he departed from Bethlehem to sojourn where he could find a place. He was looking for somewhere to live. And then in chapter 19, verse 1, it tells us again, there was a Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim. That idea sojourn means travel, wandering, looking for something. So both of these stories include a reference to there was no king, and everybody's doing it was right. They both start or originate with somebody from Bethlehem and both stories start with a Levite who is wandering. And I want to start with that setting of a Levite wandering because you say, well, what, what does that have to do with anything? Well, the Levites were the uh, special selected family line who were supposed to be caring for and leading the worship for the nation of Israel. They were the ones taking care of the tabernacle and providing the service for it and doing the offerings and doing a lot of the work of taking care of it. And they had designated cities they would live in and designated times where they would work and they would serve. So the idea that both of these stories start with a Levite who was wandering let us know that the people of Israel as a whole were not worshiping God. So the Levites, who should be serving in God's tabernacle, were left looking for a job. So the first hint we have that something is wrong in this world in which these stories take place is that the people of God are not pursuing the things of God, so this Levite, who's supposed to be interceding for the people, has no one for whom to intercede no job and they are left wandering. So the world this takes place in is when people have left the things of God and are pursuing their own goals and their own dreams. And that setting alone really connects this passage with uh, many times in human history and now is no exception. And it's into this world that we now dive in and look at the story that takes place from chapter 17 and 18. But the story actually starts in Judges chapter 1. And I want to set the stage for you. And I'm not going to read all of chapter 17 and 18 for you. I'm going to kind of walk you through the story um, and explain what is going on for you. But in Judges chapter 1, the, the book is really setting the stage for us. And near the end of Judges chapter 1 and verse 34 it tells us that the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain for they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. But the Amorites would dwell in Mount Harris and Ajlon and in Shabim, yet the hand and it's going to go on and talk about someone else. So it doesn't seem like much but what happened is when the Israelites divided up the land the tribe of Dan got this portion of land that had both hill country and flatlands. Now they were able to settle in the hill country, but when they tried to take over the flatlands, they lost the battle originally. 
the, the Amorites were able to repel them and so the people of Dan could not take over the flatlands. They ended up stuck in the hills. Now, for the most part, we're not going to hear about the tribe of Dan through most of the book of Judges. They're going to stay in those hills and not take over that plain area that God had designated for them. So they had failure here at the beginning and what we find out is they have never continued to seek after God and try to take that land back over. Even Samson was from the tribe of Dan. And Samson did so many things all on his own, none of his family even show up until after he dies. So we know that the tribe of Dan is not being involved in what's going on. They aren't being connected to all that God is doing. And they are now going to come and be a major part of our story here in chapter 17 and 18. But the story actually starts a little bit different. Let me just talk you through this story. It's a really crazy story. And if, if you don't catch all the details, just go ahead and get into this later on during this week and come back to it. But what happens is in the Mount Ephraim there was this man named Micah. And what Micah did is he stole a large amount of money from his mother. His mother had uh, over a thousand um, pieces of silver and he stole it from her. Well, when his mother finds out someone stole her silver, she puts a curse on the silver so that whoever stole it uh, suffers. So she curses her silver that was stolen. Now when her son finds out that she cursed the silver, he goes back to her and says, Hey mom, I, I'm the one who stole your silver. And when he tells her that, rather than her being upset, she turns around and blesses her son, who just stole her money. And what she does then is he gives her the money back, remember that he took and she cursed, now she gives it back to her, and she says, I dedicated the silver to the Lord for my son. So now I'm going to give it back to you. So now she gives the silver to her son and saying that she had intended him to make an idol with it. We find out in verse 3. So he restored the money. She gives him a portion of the money, not the whole amount, 200 of her 1,100 that she had had. And this man Micah then had a house with gods. He made an ephod, which is a special garment uh, that they would wear for religious purposes. And he basically then created and made in his house his own religion and chose one of his sons to be a priest in his house in this special religion that he made. And so this crazy story of a son stealing from his mother and then giving it back and then she gives it to him so he can make idols and he makes up his own religion is just a reminder that people are not following God, they're not interested in God, they, they just do what they want. And this guy Micah wanted to make his own religion, so he did, he made an idol. And what we find out then is there was this Levite from Bethlehem who goes out and is looking for a job. And he comes upon this guy, Micah. And Micah finds out that he's a Levite. So Micah's really excited. And so he invites this Levite to come live at his house and be his own personal priest. He offers to pay him an annual salary of silver and give him clothes every year. And just says, hey, come come live in my house. I have, I have these idols. I have a shrine. You can be my priest. And the Levite says yes. He's, he's looking for a place to live, he's looking for a job, and here comes along a job. It pays well, it'll take care of him, so he signs up, and he agrees. And we find at the end of chapter 17 that Micah is really excited, because he thinks, because he has a Levite serving as a priest, even though it's his own made-up religion and idol, because it's a Levite, that God is going to bless him. This means that during this time, 
the people know so little about who their God is and what he desires that this man thinks that just having a Levite be a priest in his own homemade household religion will gain him favor from God. People fail to understand the character of their God and they think that they can use connections to God in some way to get benefit. So that's the setting, but those aren't the main characters of what's going to happen here because that comes now in chapter 18. So we, we come back now to the tribe of Dan, this tribe that had tried to take over some of their land but had failed. And so they've been waiting in the hill country. We find out they're not happy with that. They, they need more land. They need more space. They want a city to call their own. And rather than go back down to the valley and try to take the portion that was given to them, they send spies out into the rest of the land to try to find an easier place to live. Did you catch that? It's very important. Rather than to take over and do the hard work that God had laid for them, they send spies out to try to find an easy place to live. And so they send these five spies out and they go and they they walk around and they come across the house of Micah, this man who had his own religion. And they see that there's a Levite there. And they ask him, what, what are you doing here? Why are you here? And they know he's not where he's supposed to be. And the Levite says, well, this man Micah, he offered me a job. He's taken care of me. I have a really great life. And so they say, oh, you know, here's a Levite. He's serving as a priest. So they ask this Levite, the man of God who they know is not where he's supposed to be, they ask him for advice. Hey, are, are we going to be successful in what we're looking for? Well, this Levite, he just is doing whatever people want him to do at this point. He tells them, yeah, go, go in peace. God's with you. Whatever you're doing, God's with you. It doesn't matter. You're good. So they then go out and these, these spies find this town, Laish, and they look around and they find out these are quiet, peaceful people. They don't have a lot of defenses. They don't have a lot of army. So they go back to their, their homes and they tell the people, hey, we found this city and it would be easy to take over. The people aren't really hard, um, hardened for battle. They're not warriors. They're peaceful people. It'd be a piece of cake. So let's, let's get our army. Let's go take over this city. So they, they pack up, they get their army together, we find out it's 600 men, and they head out on this journey to take over this city. But before they come to the city, they stop by this guy's Micah's house. And we find that the five spies say, hey, we need to stop here. Hold on a minute, let's go into this house. So they come to Micah's house, they say hi, and in verse 16 of chapter 18, we find these 600 men with their weapons stood by the entrance to Micah's yard. They're just standing there at the gate. And the five spies, they go up and they take all the idols and the ephod and the things out of Micah's shrine, his temple. They just take all the things out of his own personal religion. And the, the Levite says, what are you doing? Why are you stealing these things? And they say, hey man, hold on, hold on. How about this? Is it better for you to be a Levite in this house where you're just serving one man and one family? Or we'll make you a deal. You come with us and you can be a priest for a whole tribe of Israel. They offer him a promotion from just being a priest for this one man, Micah, to being a priest for the whole tribe of Dan. So what does the Levite do? Sounds like a great deal. He agrees and he goes with them. He was, his, it tells us in verse 20, his heart was glad. So he took the idols, he took the ephod, and he went with this army. So they turned and they head out. And Micah comes and tries to stop them, but they say, just go back. We wouldn't want to have to kill you. Just go back to your house, 
leave us alone. And so Micah does. He, he gives up and he goes back home. And so this, this army now of Dan, who now has a Levite and the idols, they go and they conquer this city that they found, they take it over, they don't have any problems, just like they suspected, and they change the name of the city to Dan, after the name of their tribe, and we find out that they take all the idols, they take all the things they stole from this man's religion, they set it up in this city, that Levite becomes the priest, and the whole tribe follows that religion. We find out all the way until hundreds of years later when the nation of Israel is taken into captivity by the Assyrians. So here we have a story of just one tribe of Israel. And what had happened was they had a designated land for them and they had a designated way in which they were to worship God. But both of those two things became difficult. They lost their initial battle trying to take over the land, so they gave up. And for whatever reason, going to, to where the tabernacle was in Shiloh was too much work for them. So in both cases, they ended up taking this battle and destroying the city and stealing this man's idols so they could easily take over the city and they set up their own religion. And from what it tells us here at the end of chapter 18 is that this was their religion. They worshipped this idol until the whole nation was destroyed and taken away. And you may say, well... Israelites struggled a lot with idolatry off and on. But let me point something out to you, and you can check it on your own. This is a whole tribe of one of the twelve tribes of Israel, the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the carriers of the promise of God's work in the world. But if you turn to the first several chapters of Chronicles, there's a genealogy that lists all the people from all the tribes that came back to Israel after they were in captivity. And as you read through that list, even though Dan is listed as a child of Jacob, you do not find anyone from the tribe of Dan returning with the people to the Promised Land. And if you turn to Revelation chapter 7, when we see... 144,000 people sealed from Israel and it goes through 12 tribes you do not see the tribe of Dan and so what we see here is that after these events this story in Judges what the tribe of Dan did in this story in Judges seems to have destroyed their connection with God and the rest of the people of Israel because they're not listed in Chronicles with the people that come back to the land. They're not listed in Revelation in the plan God has for the nation of Israel in the book of Revelation. They're left out. All because probably of their actions here in the story in Judges. And so let me bring this down, practically speaking. Why does this matter? I, I, I'm not of the tribe of Dan. This has no relevance. But what I want you to see is that the tribe of Dan had an opportunity to be a part of what God was doing in the world. They were of God's chosen people. They had their own promised land. They had their own prescribed way of worship. But it got difficult. The circumstances of life posed a barrier and a challenge to them. It was difficult to take over the land. It wasn't easy to travel to where the tabernacle was to worship God in the correct way. And so what we find out is that Dan's, like all the other characters in this story, they went after what was the easiest most profitable option for them at the time. 
rather than take over the land God gave them, they hunted out what was going to be the easiest option. Rather than worship the God who gave them that land, they took their own religion for themselves, just like they took their own city and they made it their own, and that is what they followed until they, as a tribe and the rest of the nation, were destroyed. See, what I see in this passage is the realization that sometimes the path God has chosen for us is difficult. And sometimes we end up separated and it's hard to accomplish the task which God has laid before us. Even right now, oh, due to the circumstances of the world as they are right now, we as a church would seem to be separated. You know, I'm sitting here recording this. Uh, you are going to watch this later, and I don't know when. I don't know when we're all going to gather and watch this. But we often will say, well, as we're gathered in the church building, the church isn't about the building and about the gathering. It's about the people that make it up. But what had happened to the tribe of Dan is that what was supposed to be their identity became difficult. Belonging to God and to this nation became difficult. And so rather than stay with where their identity was guaranteed by God, they went off and sought that which was easy. See, right now, we would say our identity is part of the church and the body of Christ, but right now, it's difficult to gather, to get together, uh, to be a part of what God is doing. And the tribe of Dan, when things got difficult, they found the easy way out. But today, as we sit here and watch and study the Word, I want us to be challenged that we should not seek the easy way out. We are a body of believers. We are united by the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ who gave His life for us. And so no matter where we are, that is who we belong to. And while we may not be able to be together, we are together in Jesus Christ. And the challenge for the people of Dan is they looked in their separation and saw the problem. Rather than look to the God who is bigger than their problem. The scripture reading uh, that was before this was from a story of a king named Jehoshaphat. And his, his time was marked by an attack on his city. And he offered, in that moment of sorrow, in that moment of fear, he offered a prayer to God where he finished it in, in Chronicles 12, verse 20. He said, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. See, the people in the story in Judges, this Levite who wandered off, his eyes were on whatever would make him most comfortable, whatever would help him survive during the hard times. This tribe of Dan, rather than look to God to help them conquer the land which he had given them, they looked to themselves to try to solve the problem and to try to achieve security and prosperity for themselves. And the challenge can be, in a moment like we are in right now, to turn our attention to survival and protection and comfort, like the people in this story did. But what God has asked us to do is to continue to be the church, to continue to look to Him, not to our circumstances, not to the waves around us like Peter as he tried to walk on the water. But our focus is to be on Jesus Christ. And if all of us as a church have our focus on Jesus Christ and what he wants us to do, we can pursue, though it may be hard, the path that will unite us as an acting body of Christ, even though we may be physically separated. So you say, well, what is, 
what does that mean? What does that look like? I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do because I need to follow the rules, and that is true. Uh, we need to um, listen to our authorities and obey what they are telling us to do. But that means that being the church will be difficult. And so we are going to need to, all of us, contribute in our own way to do that. What do you mean, Caleb? Well, what I mean is this. Even though the, we are separated, we are still to love and to care for one another, we need to work extra hard to, to reach out to one another, to call one another, to check on one another, to see uh, what may be we can do to help if people need help or if there's some way, um, some an item uh, that they may need or they need to talk or they need to pray together. We also need to continue to each of us be growing. So we need to be studying the word, we need to be looking at it. Uh, we need to be challenging each other to do that. Um, maybe we all uh, can work to memorize some scripture uh, while we're all separated. But at the same time, the church is also supposed to be sharing the gospel, and we need to be doing that as well. And even though we're separated from people, we have family, we have friends, not all know Jesus Christ. And many of them right now are experiencing more fear than normal. And their fear is an opportunity for us to express the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And all of these things are going to take more work, more creativity, more effort, and isn't always going to be feel the same way we're used to. But yet, if we want to be different than this Levite in the tribe of Dan, who lost so much, lost their place in the promise of God because they sought the easy way out, then we together need to work and pray and seek out ways together we can be the church and love and encourage one another and the world around us no matter the circumstances. The tribe of Dan faced tough circumstances and they pursued what was best for them and was easy. We sit here today facing unknown circumstances but we as the church can choose not to seek the easy way or the comfortable way but to seek to follow after Jesus Christ and continue to love, to serve, and to reach out to this world in whatever way God can prompt our hearts. So let's work together to do that. Uh, let's talk, let's encourage, let's lift one another up in prayer. And may this time not be something we look back on and we're glad to forget, but it's a testimony to how amazing God is and how he can use us to accomplish great things no matter the circumstances.